All right, the kingdom parables. This is lesson number seven in this uh, series. The title of this lesson, Parable of the Wheat and Tares. And if you're following along in your Bibles, we will be in Matthew chapter 13. So this week and next week, we're going to be actually completing our series. We have one more lesson after this one. Uh, we did say in the past that um, these were teachings designed, these teachings on the uh, kingdom parables were designed to do a couple of things. First of all, to explain the nature of the spiritual kingdom that Jesus came to establish. Each week, if you've noted, we've studied various characteristics of the kingdom by looking at the parables that Jesus used in order to describe it. This is the manner in which He used to describe His kingdom. Also, uh, it was a device used to separate the believers from the unbelievers. By using parables, Jesus would teach publicly to crowds of people, but uh, as we've mentioned before, only those who believed in Him would actually understand the meaning of these sayings and uh, how they pertained to themselves and the other people who were listening. So it was a coding device that He used and He even described this and explained this to his apostles when they asked. In many instances, Jesus would give the parable and then when his disciples would press him, uh, he'd provide the meaning for them. Not all, but in some instances. And we have an example of one such parable in the wheat and the tares, the, thing, the uh, parable we're going to be looking at today. Now, this parable follows the one concerning the sower and the seed, where Jesus is using uh, agricultural examples to teach about the kingdom. By its proximity to the first parable, the sower and the seed, um, uh, by its proximity to that particular parable, the one on the wheat and the tares may have been the second parable that Jesus spoke during His ministry. Remember last time we said, sower and the seed, I believe that may have been the, the very first one that he spoke, this one here, the second one. So let's go to uh, Matthew chapter 13 and read uh, through this and see what the Lord is teaching us. So we begin verse 24, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. So the, the parable is about the kingdom, it's not about the world because he begins it by saying the kingdom of heaven is like, right? It takes place and describes events in the kingdom and that's important to remember that a lot of people sometimes make the mistake, take this information where Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like and somehow they try to apply this to life in the world. And you know, it doesn't fit, it doesn't match. Well, he, he's, he's not saying the world is like, He's saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. So we have to always keep that in context. Verse 25, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. Tares or darnel, weed-like grass that resembles wheat, but has a, it actually has a more firm root system. The landowner sows good wheat, and while the laborers are sleeping, the darnel or the tares are sown by his enemy. Pretty straightforward story so far. But when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. So the fact that the tares had been sown only became evident when both began to grow. So, you know, things are going on in the kingdom that you don't always see. We've understood that. And sometimes those things that are going on are not necessarily positive. Okay. Verse 27, the slaves of the landowner came and said to Jesus, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? So the workers questioned the possibility of there being tares among the wheat. How could this be so? They know they didn't do it. You know, this is a controlled area where you know, they're working specifically. So they're, you know, we didn't do this, who did this? And so the owner begins to give them the reason why this is so. In verse 28, he says to them, an enemy has done this. The slave said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, no, for while you are gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat 
with there. Remember I said the tears, this type of uh, growth here has a, a, a firm a root structure, more firm actually than the, than the, uh, than the wheat. And so um, in verse uh, 29 he says, while you're gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat uh, with them. So the workers want to identify and remove the tares, but the owner tells them to allow both of them to grow side by side until full maturity. Remember the story in the sequence, there's going to be meaning to this later on. Now in the case of the tares, uh, their close and strong roots, as I mentioned, might serve to damage the good plants if they were to be torn out. Also, they resemble the good crop and so the good plants could be torn up by mistake as well. And so in verse 30, the parable continues uh, with the owner saying, allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers first, gather up the tares and bind them in bunches to burn them up but gather the wheat into my barn. So the owner instructs the workers to wait until the harvest, when it'll be easier to separate the good from the bad, and they will deal with each accordingly, one for keeping, the other for burning. Sounds familiar to a lot of the other parables, right? There's a day of reckoning that's going to come, and there's a day of separation that's going to come. It's not as if they're so mysterious, these parables. They, they tend to repeat the same storyline. Different, uh, different framework, however. So then there's the explanation of the parable in verses 36 to 43. So like the parable of the sower and the seed, there's a break in the story where Jesus, in this case, gives another parable and reasons why he spoke in parables. We've talked about this at another time. So we pick up the story then in 36, verse 36, so let's read that. It says, then he, meaning now we're talking about Jesus, then he left the crowds and went into the house and his disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. So apparently after going out into the boat, remember we talked about that last time, after going out into the boat, he taught several parables and then returned from the shore back into his family home. This is uh, when the disciples come and ask for an explanation of the parable of the tares and the wheat. So Jesus had spoken another parable about the mustard seed and they did not ask about this particular parable. Perhaps the parable that contained a judgment stirred them to ask for an explanation because the mustard seed, you know, it's mostly good news with the mustard seed. We'll talk about that later. You know, the birds find a shelter and you know, it's a happy story with a happy ending. Here, again, there's a reckoning. And so the apostles are curious about this reckoning and what all of this may mean. So let's keep going. Verse 37, he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man and the field is the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom, and the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So Jesus gives a quick rundown of the characters in the parable and who they represent in real life. Uh, Jesus himself, he says, is the sower, and he refers to himself as the son of man. Interesting. Uh, this explanation, this term son of man, first seen in Daniel chapter seven, verse 13, where Daniel is seeing a vision that represents the end of the world where God gives to this quote son of man all the dominion and authority and establishes his kingdom forever. And so in Daniel's vision, the Son of Man refers to the Messiah to come. Now Jesus, he rarely used the term king. When he talked about himself, he never talked about himself as the king. I mean, he was king of king, Lord of, but you never hear him talk to himself or talk about himself using the term king or Messiah, indirectly he says that to the woman at the well, you know, you know that person who's to come, that Messiah, I am he, but he still doesn't actually use the word in relationship to himself, because these terms were heavy with meaning for the Jews, which were not necessarily accurate 
You know, when, the, when you said the word Messiah to the Jews of those days, many of them saw a worldly leader you know, uh, coming with great power, coming somehow to restore Israel to some sort of political or world uh, power. And so to use that term would perhaps be um, engendering in their minds a worldly leader, making him you know, some sort of great powerful individual. So Jesus uses this Old Testament term for himself because it did two things in particular. First, it was a scriptural term referring to the Messiah and his work and the kingdom. So he was accurately referring to himself but using an obscure term that didn't, you know, it, wasn't a, uh, it wasn't a word that would create any type of uh, a strong reaction. And then secondly, it was not a term, as I say, that the Jews had ever used or invested any kind of meaning, either good or bad. So it was an honest scriptural way to refer to himself truthfully, accurately as to who he was, but it wasn't a baited word. It wasn't a word that would cause you know, his listeners to, uh, to riot or to question. So he uses this term son of man to refer to himself in an obscure way as the Messiah and to put into context the things that he will say about the kingdom and its futures. So he uses a term that means Messiah but has not been polluted by worldly ideas. So, so much for the son of man term that he uses. Then he goes on to say the field is the world itself. The seed of the kingdom is planted all over the world by, by Jesus. The good news, uh, excuse me, the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. Now before, the seed was God's word. In the parable, you know, the seed uh, is, is not God's word, but it is eventually what God's word produces. Christians, those who make up the kingdom. So from parable to parable, the same words don't always mean the same thing. So the sower and the seed, the seed was the word. Here, the wheat and the tares, the seed are people. The end result of what happens when the seed is planted uh, in a good heart. The tares are the sons of the devil, the ones who have believed Satan and follow him, whether they know it or not. So it reminds me of, the, of a song by Bob Dylan uh, long ago when he went through his Christian phase. Did you know that? Bob Dylan went through a phase where he considered himself a born again Christian and he wrote a song. And the song was, you've got to serve somebody. It was interesting in his song, absolutely accurate biblically, you've got to serve somebody. You're either going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve the devil. It's, that's the only choice that you have. And in the song he talks about you can knowingly serve the Lord or you can knowingly serve the devil. You could also unknowingly serve the devil because you refuse to serve the Lord. Very interesting and concise way of explaining you know, a Christian's choice in life. And so here Jesus talks about the sons of the devil, the ones who have believed Satan and follow him whether they know it or not. You know, if you don't follow Jesus, then you do follow Satan, whether you're aware of it or not. The tares are sown, now here's the interesting part, the tares are sown where? Well, in the kingdom. In the kingdom. Who are they? Well, they're the hypocrites who talk like Christians, but they don't act like Christians. They're the spies who are with the people in the kingdom, but only there because it suits their purpose. What is their purpose? Well, who knows? Money, prestige of some kind, comfort. They're the backsliders. They're the sinners who have begun to be influenced more by Satan and the world than Christ and his word. But they go through the motions. Again, I've mentioned this before. We ought not to be surprised that, uh, you know, we, have a sign on the, we have a sign on the 23rd. You know, it says, sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. 
And we say that because we're trying to tell people, hey, we're not holier than thou, we're not you know, trying to prove that we're better than other people. If you realize that you're a sinner, you're welcome among us, why? Well, that's all we have here. We, all we have are sinners, converted, forgiven, restored, renewed, regenerated. But you know, that's the one thing everybody shares in common. I was a sinner, I was lost, now I'm saved. That's what the sign says. Now, sinners are welcome, but they're not welcome to just remain sinners, remain unrepentant, remain unbelieving, you know? We start there, but we want you to move, we want you to move forward. So the influence that produces these evil and wicked ones, the parable says, is the devil. Just as the word has the power to create a Christian and transform him or her into Christ likeness, Satan and his deceptive ways also have the power to transform people into evil and unbelieving individuals as well. You know, in our society today, we're having problems believing in evil. I mean, how many people have to, <laughs> what do people have to do to prove that there's evil in the world? You know, we've, we haven't watched the videos, thankfully, but we, we know they're out there of innocent people being hacked to death simply because they believe in Jesus or simply because they refuse to believe in a particular religion or point of view of that religion. Well, if that's not evil, I don't know what is. That people who abduct children and torture and kill them. Is there another word for that? Is there another way? How, what, what other word do you have to describe that type of behavior? but evil. And so long ago, Jesus is saying, hey, there, not only is there evil in the world, there's even evil in the kingdom. It's not tolerated, it's not wanted, it's not de desired, but you, know, you may be sitting next to someone who may be saying, I believe in Jesus in words, but mm, their actions and their life uh, are not reflective of that. Then he says the harvest is when Jesus returns at the end of the world, as we know uh, it will take place. The reapers, the workers who separate, he says, angels, messengers. Paul the apostle said that the angels will have a voice at the end of the world and will accompany the Lord, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. He also says they will come in flaming fire at the end, you know, referring to judgment. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. So he's given a rundown as to who the characters are, you know, giving a little information about the, the key people and situations in the parable. So he goes on in verse 40, he says, so just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, there's his reference once again, will send forth his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. Notice what he says, will gather out of his kingdom. His kingdom, not the kingdom of darkness, his kingdom. And will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father he who has ears, let them hear. So Jesus continues to make the parallel between this parable and the end of the, uh, the, end of the world. The separation of the tares and the wheat is a mirror of what will happen at judgment for those who are, quote, in the kingdom, not the judgment of the entire world. I'm not suggesting here there are, you know, there's a judgment here and then there's another judgment. You know, you know, we've talked about this before in studying First Thessalonians, you know, the, it all happens. You know. In the Bible, the Bible describes the events, if you wish, taking place when Jesus returns in various places. There's no one page that, in the Bible that contains all of the information about what takes place at the end. But when you put all of them together, all the events that take place, the, you know, the dissolution of this world, the new heavens and the earth, the coming of Jesus, the judgment, the, the dead in Christ rot, you know, all those different things, they all happen, they all happen, the twinkling of an eye. 
No time to say, oh, wait, 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 wait. It, well, is it too late to apologize? No, we don't have that, we don't have that, that time. That's why the warning over and over again, he, he warns. Sometimes I'm, I'm thinking of at the end of the world, and this is only a human thought. You know, people say, well, I didn't know. And, and, and he is saying, how many times do I have to, to repeat? How many parables end in this way? How many cautions does he give? How many times do the apostles warn over and over and over again? Be ready, you never know when he'll come. So at the end, certainly there will be a judgment between believers and unbelievers, of course. But Jesus says that there will also be a separation between those who believed and those who said that they believed, but they didn't belong, them too. So those who belong in the kingdom will simply remain there. Those who aspire to be in the kingdom, but who give offense to the brethren, to the Lord, to the world. And those who practice sin, lawlessness, practice sin, not guilty of sin, we're all guilty of sin. The thing that we're pursuing as Christians in the church, in the kingdom, we're pursuing to do away with the practice of sin in our lives, not the occasion of sin. And so those who practice sin will be removed and be placed in hell. So after this separation, the righteous, what does he say? Will be glorified. What does that refer to? Well, the new bodies to enable them to exist in heaven, in the heavenly realm. We have a physical body made for this earthly realm. We breathe in the air, we exhale carbon dioxide. You know what I'm saying? We, we, we're built this way. We eat the food, we void the waste. We, we're designed for this place. And Jesus here and in other places tells us, but we will need a new body, a new container, if you wish, a new essence in order to survive, in order to exist, a better word, in order to exist in the dimension that is to come. We, we can't exist there with this body, a new God body. The Bible refers to it as a glorified <coughs> body. And then to be exalted, lifted up to be with God forever. So you know, the, the point of our life the, the, the objective of our spiritual life is not the glorified body. The glorified body is simply the means to the end. The glorified body enables us to exist in, a, in another dimension that we, we see a little bit of now, but not quite clearly. But the purpose for the glorified body is the exaltation of the individual to be in a different kind of relationship with God, with the Godhead, okay? They will be of light, pure in intention and thought and conduct, just like the heavenly Father. Won't that be wonderful? No bad thoughts, I'm happy for that. No more bad thoughts, no more jealousy. I will, not, I will no longer be jealous of a brother or sister that demonstrates a higher level of devotion or purity or goodness than I. Imagine, you can be jealous because somebody's got a nicer car than you. you know, that's earthly, that's fleshly. But to get the ping of jealousy because you've seen someone who's just higher than you are, better, further into the kingdom, more developed spiritually. There won't even be that, that little essence of jealousy, nothing to spoil anything. What we say, what we think, what we hope for, what we pray for, what we declare before God, all of it be good and pure. No impurities from, from this world. So Jesus warns even his disciples to pay attention and be careful to abide by this teaching according to this, according to this parable. All right, so this uh, parable also gives us some significant insight into the kingdom, especially at the end of time. 
Remember I told you all these kingdom parables, you know, they give you pieces of the puzzle. And uh, you know, he doesn't say everything there is to say about the kingdom in one parable. You pick up a piece here, a puzzle there, an idea here, you start putting it together and it begins to emerge. An image begins to emerge. So here are some of the things that we, that we learn from this particular parable. And there's maybe not be an exhaustive list here, but a couple of things anyways that are obvious. The kingdom is universal. In other words, God's kingdom is all over the world. Wherever people respond to His gospel, there will grow the good wheat of the kingdom. Also, that there is good soil everywhere. Our job is to go plant the seed. That's why we do mission work. That's why we support people. That's why we encourage our young people to you know, think larger thoughts than just Choctaw, Oklahoma, but think. Think about Ecuador and think about uh, uh, East Germany, or think about Russia, or th you know, think about Asia. You know, open your mind. The fields are wide unto harvest. The good soil exists everywhere. But those who are sowing the seed are not everywhere. Also, there is good soil, as I say, <clears throat> everywhere. Our job is to go plant that seed. The universality of the kingdom, we see it. Another point, there are pretenders in the kingdom. People leave the church because they're, sometimes they're hypocrites and, and sinful people who show no repentance. And the saddest thing in the world is a, a, you know, a sincere, godly saint suffering some kind of offense from someone who you know, maybe doesn't belong in the kingdom. And, and we manage to keep the person who doesn't belong and lose the person who does. Because they're under the false impression that once they're in the church, they should be surrounded by people who are better than they are, more perfect than they are, more spiritual than they are. In other words, you shouldn't see any sin in the church. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Impossible, right? There are secret sinners and spies who have no business being here, but they remain to carry on their own agenda. This mustn't discourage us. This is not a sign of failure of the kingdom. I guess that's my point. Jesus didn't fail. The church is not failing because there are parts of the church or individuals in the church who are clearly not living the Christian life. It's really a sign that Satan is still at work. It doesn't mean I, I become uh, you know, lackadaisical. It's not just, oh well, the church is not perfect. Oh well, there are some people who really you know, are, are not sincere in the church. And Well, no, of course not. I, I'm going to work on those people. As a minister, I'm going to preach and, and exhort and admonish and, 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 and discipline, if I have to, those individuals. Why? To save their soul, to get them to really embrace their faith and to live what they say they believe. And of course, <laughs> we know this, but Satan's not interested in Hugh Hefner, Mr. Playboy. He's not expending a lot of energy trying to you know, destroy his soul. I think, you know, without making an overall judgment, I think Mr. Hefner has demonstrated quite clearly that he doesn't believe in God, he's an irreligious person, that he promotes a lifestyle which is, uh, which is not uh, compatible, let's put it that way, to Christian thinking. So you know, Satan, if, if, if I'm just saying this, you know, if he has so many resources, he's not going to allot a whole lot of resources to try to spoil Mr. Hefner's soul. But he will make an effort to perhaps spoil a young man's soul in the church who's fresh and new as a Christian, who doesn't know a lot, who could be tempted by Mr. Hefner's influence into some kind of secret sin. Number, no, num, number one, you know the number one reason for the retirement or the withdrawal or the firing of youth ministers in all churches? All churches, I don't mean just the Church of Christ, I mean all 
quote, Christian churches, number one reason. Addiction to pornography. Addiction to online pornography, it's terrible. More young ministers lose their jobs and lose their careers because of that. And you say, why? <laughs> well, because you know, young men and women today, they're online, that's where the temptation, is. the good is perhaps, but that's where a lot of the temptation lies. And they've had their lives and their careers and unfortunately their souls spoiled by that. So absolutely Satan, he'll attack you know, the thing that you know, threatens to destroy his agenda, his influence, and that's the church. And where will he go? Well, he's not going to go after you know, Brother Harold, <laughs> who's been an elder for 50 years. You know, I, think, I think Brother Harold kind of knows what's going on. He's going to go after Mike. He's going to go after uh, Jacob. He's going to go after uh, young men and women. He's going to go after them, the future leaders. Make sure that they don't even get started, get no traction as far as their faith and their service is concerned. So there are pretenders in the kingdom and the kingdom is targeted specifically by, by Satan. And then thirdly, no one escapes judgment. Remember, based on this parable, there are other ideas, but I think this one certainly is clear. Unfortunately, a lot of times we in the church we think that our job is to find out who belongs in the kingdom and who doesn't. You know, we're the marshal. But our job is to sow the seed of the kingdom and bear the fruit of the kingdom, not rip out those who feel don't belong here. Remember, the workers were not permitted to pull out the tares. Do you think there's a lesson there for us? Do you think that there's some sort of parallel with our idea? We think we know who are the ones that don't belong. Jesus guarantees that at the, at the end, all those who don't belong in the kingdom will be rooted out, judged, and punished. And only those who belong will remain. He promises that right here. That's what he tells us. So just like the first century disciples, Jesus says to all who hear his parables, pay attention. If you have ears to hear, pay attention. Now this parable was aimed primarily at those who were in the kingdom but didn't belong there because of their disbelief or their lifestyle, their secret sins or secret allegiances, so on and so forth. In real life, tares cannot become wheat. But in, the, in those who sin, those who deny Jesus, those who are being right, or who are not living right rather, they can repent, they can be restored to a right relationship with God again. You see the parallel doesn't work all the way. You know, in, in, in real life, in agricultural terms, it doesn't matter what you do with the tares, they're always going to be tares. But in real life, in the kingdom life, those who may not belong, who are drifting away, who are insincere, they can become wheat. They can become faithful. You know, they are, they can be influenced by the word, by our lifestyle, by our love, by our admonition, by our encouragement. And I think it's incumbent upon us to, you know, to make that effort if we see, not just somebody who's outright evil, but I mean, we know a brother or sister who's struggling. Who are they going to go to for help? Well, not somebody in the world, that's for sure. So we need to be open to that. Instead of deciding we're the ones that decide who's in or out, maybe we should decide I'm the one who's going to help. I'm the one who's going to encourage this brother or sister to remain faithful or to maybe step up their game a little bit. You know, the best question to ask, we, we always I hear people you know, in the foyer, so how's it going? Not bad. So how are you feeling? Oh, good. All right, blah, blah. But we never ask the question, how's your spiritual life? That's a legit question. The answer could be, pretty good, thank you for asking. Or it could be, yeah, fine. You know. Or it could be, well, I'm glad you asked because I've been praying about something for quite a while and I haven't had an answer. Oh, really? Yeah. 
would you like to share? Well, you know, my wife has been sick. And, you know what I'm saying? If you don't ask, you don't get an answer. And we're too, I, again, this is not a, you know, I'm, I'm not faulting anyone in particular, but we're awfully quick to ask, so who's, did your team win the Super Bowl? Which is fine, you know, it's all right. But how, you know, how are you doing spiritually? I have a feeling that there are people in our own congregation who ache and who are just waiting to be opened up just by a simple show of interest in their spiritual life. And they would respond to that. And all of us would be stronger for it if we were sensitive. Remember, we come to church because we believe in God and we believe in Christ and we, we're looking forward to, the, to heaven. You know, we don't have to apologize to each other for talking to each other about spiritual things. It's not like if you're at the restaurant somewhere with a bunch of people from work and everybody's you know, having a burger, you know, a quick lunch from work, and in the middle of all of this you say, well, has anyone would like to share their latest spiritual struggles with me? Uh, not, you know, there's a time and a place. But in the church, every time is a good time to inquire about our spiritual condition and to share it with someone else. All right, so there's a, a little bit of treatment as far as the parable of the wheat and the tares. We've got one more lesson to go. That'll be next week. Thank you for your attention.